morning. We've got another beautiful day in Hyrule and today in particular is quite special because I'm going to be riding past a place that I actually spent a lot of my childhood and oh okay so there's the sign from the goddess herself goddess Hylia with a double rainbow okay guys well some of you asked me you know to talk a little bit about what it was like growing up here in Hyrule and I wasn't sure I was feeling a little bit shy but um when you look out here and we've got a sun shower and a double rainbow I think that's the biggest nudge I could get to open up a bit so let's come out here this is the Apollean forest so we're in Hyrule Field and this part of it's the Apollean forest and um, wow these blue flowers they they're still here. They almost look like forget-me-nots in a way. <laughs> when I was a young child, my grandfather was teaching me how to fight with a wooden sword and teaching me how to use a bow and arrow. We were standing in this field of Hyrule, um, right near the Apollean forest, and he took out a purple pufferfish-looking balloon. <laughs> he explained to me it was an octo-balloon. And it's made from some pesky creatures native to Hyrule. They're a buoyant species capable of hiding not only under plants but under the surface of bodies of water too. They have large heads and they defend themselves by attacking anything that moves too close to their hiding spot. Oh wow, look at the nature that's, that's around here. It's so beautiful. <laughs> But yeah, they protect themselves and they attack anything that moves by projecting hard lumps of dirt, clay and stones um, at the person. When they die, their innards, as gnarly as this is, uh, can be preserved and later serve to be easily inflated like a balloon. So we've actually got some here, so I'll show you <laughs> while I'm talking about it. Um, Octo balloons and their ability to inflate and float are therefore valuable resources for any aspiring archer. Um, we could attach them to any object of a small to medium size and float the object into the air, just like that. What I'm doing with the apple right now. And we could use some more or less or hit them with an arrow or hit the object with an arrow as well. After floating said object, the student could practice adding different weights to the balloon to vary the height and distance of the target. This made for a fun game where archery students and teenagers fond of pranks like this little one we just spoke to here could get into all sorts of mischief by floating objects with octo balloons. One of those prank loving kids was my grandfather actually. <laughs> His birth name was Nova and he was such a cheeky child that he was dubbed Nevi affectionately in his youth. I know most nicknames tend to be shorter than one's name, but Nova was a remarkable person in every way. So in my mind, it always made sense that he had an unusual nickname as well. As he aged, he was known as a beloved mentor to a lot of people. And um, if we just open up our map right now, you can see where he grew up and where I grew up, right there in the, um, in the Apollean forest and what it looks like in the context of Hyrule. Um, he was so, so cheeky. And um, he he grew he actually grew up to be quite sensible. He grew up to be a mentor, and he ended up embodying that paternal nurturing of his heavenly namesake. <laughs> My grandfather was telling me he got quite the walloping from his archery <laughs> his archery instructor. 
I love those forget-me-not type of flowers. From his archery instructor after an octo balloon prank went astray. <laughs> My grandfather attached several octo balloons to his instructor's favorite bow and thought it would be quite the laugh to hide behind a large tree. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those over to the right. And watch as his instructor jumped about trying to retrieve it from the air. Instead, he overestimated the amount of balloons that would be needed to float the bow. Before he knew it, he was chasing the bow as it was swept away over a mound of grass. In a panicked attempt to chase the floating bow down, he grabbed his instructor's horse and set off at a gallop in a frazzled attempt to undo the mayhem he had caused. Sadly, he was unable to catch up to the bow, <laughs> yet he struck a marvellous figure as he rode boldly over the hills with the strapping chestnut stallion. His instructor's name was Garrett, and he came outside just at that moment to see him riding up a hill <laughs> on the eye-catching horse, and Garrett was rather conflicted in his reaction. On one hand, the lad was riding so well and at such an impressive clip that the part of him that was angered by one of his students riding his horse without permission was overridden by the other part of him that was struck into silence by the undeniable display of skill. <laughs> oh, and a lot of you wanted to see Hyrule Castle so if we just stop here sorry to interrupt um we can be struck into silence by the majesty of what was hmm. his expression softened when he uh saw how well he was doing and he said well I can't deny that that's impressive indeed and he chuckled and started to walk towards his student. And Garrett's amused expression quickly fell into dismay. Well, kind of how I felt when I am reminded of the wall when I look at the castle. And there's so many mixed feelings when I look over here. It's so majestic and beautiful. And yet at the same time, it's so sad that it's in ruins now. But... Garrett lost his prized bow as it floated off over a cliff with the octo balloons and tumbled into the wind like bulbous purple fairies teasing flightless mortals with their playfully cruel trickery. <laughs> Nevy, Nevy, get over here, you scoundrel. What in the name of Hylia have you done to my falcon bow that was handed down to me by my own teacher when I was a boy? What possessed you to float it away like that? And why are you riding Chester? To this, my grandfather didn't have any good answers. Well, at least not good enough to calm an incensed adult on the brink of grief over his lost boyhood treasure. He was chased back to the farmhouse with a huge karak leaf. I had one of those strapped onto my back earlier, the big leaf. And uh, given a swift whack or two along the way. <laughs> wow, it's really beautiful crossing this bridge, isn't it? Just struck by that. <laughs> My grandpa said to me, well, kiddo, I'd like to pretend to have been a wise kid who instantly learnt my lessons, but in the spirit of honesty, that was not the last of my octoballoon hijinks. I'll have to tell you about the others another time, but for now, let's focus on improving your aim. And we spent the rest of the afternoon popping balloons and arrows and swords in the sun, and the sun was decorating the apple trees with generous splashes of golden light. I'll never forget all the time and TLC my grandfather put into me. Whenever I pass that Hyrule field, even with the castle and the ruins looking the way that they do now, I'm taken back in my memories and I like to think of all the times we practiced together, picking apples, riding horses and walking about the meadows. 
I listened to so many stories of his childhood, his farmhand jobs, and the things he learned from Garrett. It makes me wish I could go back in time. I'd love to show him Dumpeel and all my other horses. I think he'd be proud of how far I've traveled and he'd be proud of all of you going on this journey with me and the friendships that I've made. All the progress that we've made and my own archery skills, well, they're not as good as his, but I like to think that I've done pretty well over time. It's absolutely amazing, wow. The sunset's so beautiful. <sighs> I've also loved to ha have met Garrett, you know, his archery instructor. Wouldn't that be so cool to meet the people from his stories and, yeah, to see the way things were before the darkness sort of came over everything. I love to learn about people I love, find out what influenced them as they grew up and what made them into the fantastic person they turned out to be. It's for that reason the intertwining stories of history interest me. At the same time, history also saddens me with its seemingly endless list of wars, petty fights, and the eternal struggle between the forces of good and evil. I understand the soul needs challenges and contrasts to the flow of perfection. In order to grow, I can't shake the feeling that I'd be personally much happier without so much loss. Huh, yeah, I, I hear a lot of you feel the same way too. I've always been an appreciative person and I fall in love with the vibrancy of the world around me every day. I learn so much from the hues of green that make the grass and the leaves of the trees so alive with healthy energy. I even appreciate the earthy colours of the dirt and dusty trails that wind through Hyrule. Those trails guide our horses through the land. I love the grounding and stability I feel when I walk barefoot or when I ride through the fresh breeze of the wilderness. There isn't much in the natural and wild world that I don't have an appreciation for and I know you all feel the same way. I think it comes as no surprise that the horses are one of my favourite animals in Hyrule and freedom is one of the most precious feelings to me. It's why I chose to be a tour guide and hopefully pass on these feelings to you and inspire you as well, that I'm so glad that you're able to come and ride and run with me, that we have boundless energy here. I was reading a poetic yet very sad book about a magical young woman who had many powers to heal the people around them. She could speak to the animals and <laughs> like Don Peel here. It's important to remember people like that and make sure to give our animals lots of love. <laughs> she loved to run with the wind and synchronize with its flow and she would let herself get lost in the natural rhythms of everything beautiful that grew. She was so bonded to the land that it became hard to see where the blood, sap and water ended up again. <laughs> One day, she was struck down by several forces of evil and injustice at the same time. After that time, she became infected with a kind of malicious disease that ate away at her health and slowly took her magic away. It was a surprisingly short time for the people of the village that she spent so much time helping and bonding with to forget the vibrant person she once was. Her body dissolved with every painful year the malicious disease refused to be banished from her being. Eventually, she could not speak with the animals, the people stopped visiting, the vibrant hues of her life melted away into the faded green greys of her blankets. She lost the ability to walk unaided and tragically started to take on the appearance of a tired crone rather than the maiden and hopeful mother she should have been. The book was very helpful in making me realise what a truly magnificent life I have lived out here on the trails of Hyrule and how precious each day of our adventure together is. On that note, I have so much fun with all of you out here. I take great pleasure in being a constant companion to you all and I hope if anyone is feeling like that magical maiden of my sad and 
thankfully fictional book that you know there are so many more paths that are yet to explore together and we have a lot of time to see Hyrule together and make meaningful connections. If anything the Horsons may be silent as far as speech we understand but they are forever supporting our journey and the whole reason we can be out here today. Sweet dreams!